this morning. Glad that those of you who are joining us online are with us as well today. Uh, let's begin this morning by worshiping uh, the Lord our God in prayer. Father God, we praise you this morning for who you are. We praise you as being the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Creator, and the Sustainer of all things. As we studied this morning in our Bible study hour, God, you made it possible for salvation through the resurrection of Jesus. And Jesus is, you are God, the resurrection and the life. And you are the way, the truth, and the life. You are the good shepherd. And we praise you this morning. God, as we worship you today, as we sing songs in praise to your name, Father, let us do that with no thought of, of anything else that's going on, as if we were standing in front of your throne, worshiping you in song, listening to you speak, giving in worship to you, God. Let everything that we do today be done for you and as if we were in your presence because God we are in your presence we praise you God it's in Christ's name I pray amen amen well, let's stand together and worship the Lord in song <clears throat> For those of you who are joining us online, again, we're excited that you're with us this morning. Uh, you'll see in the comments a link to a digital connection card. Click on that. That Number one, when you fill that out and submit that, that lets us know that, that you are watching this morning. We would love to know that you are with us this morning. So uh, comment uh, underneath the video or send in that digital connection card so that we can know that you're here. But that's also, again, a great way to communicate with me. Fill that out. Uh, check any of the boxes that are on there. If you have prayer requests, submit that. Those things will come directly to me. So let us know that you're worshiping with us this morning. 
Our scripture reading for this morning is from Malachi chapter 1, and uh, I'm going to be reading, what verses? 11 through, 11 through 14. 11 through 14. I was not scheduled to read this this morning, that's why I had to make sure. Um, Bradley was, was scheduled to read this, but he had uh, an emergency at work, and so he had to, to leave abruptly this morning. So let's pray for for him and for his work as we go to the Lord in prayer in just a moment. Malachi chapter 1 verses 11 through 14. This is God speaking. My name will be great among the nations. From the rising of the sun to its setting, incense and pure offerings will be presented in my name in every place because my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of armies. But you are profaning it when you say the Lord's table is defiled and its product, its food, is contemptible. You also say, look, what a nuisance. And then you scorn it, says the Lord of armies. You bring the stolen, lame, or sick animals. You bring this as an offering. Am I to accept that from your hands, asks the Lord? The deceiver is cursed who has an acceptable male in his flock and makes a vow but sacrifices a defective animal to the Lord. For I am a great king, says the Lord of armies, and my name will be feared among the nations. Let's pray. God, I know that, that today we, we read that passage and, and we don't sacrifice animals. And so there are times where when we read that, we just pass right on by because we think that doesn't apply to us. But the Apostle Paul wrote in Romans that we're to present our bodies, our lives as a living sacrifice to you, holy and acceptable. And so I know that for us, the application of this verse is, God, we don't need to give you the leftovers. Oh, we don't need to give you the leftovers in our lives, God. We're, we're to give you the best that we have, the best of who we are. Uh, that our first thoughts are for serving you. That our first actions, and, and really all actions, are, are serving you. And, and we understand that, that when we give you less than that, God, it, it's sin. It's not acceptable to you, God. So where we have failed in this, God, we confess to you this morning and we ask for forgiveness. Now, we, we fail in giving you our best. We don't spend time with you like we should. I, I struggle with that. We don't give like we should. We don't live before others as a representative of Christ like we should. God, we don't give you our best. And so for that, we ask for forgiveness. And we know that if we confess our sins, that you are faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we praise you, God, right now for your forgiveness when we fail in this area. As we move on to, to worship you in song this morning, God, we move on together as a forgiven people who have confessed our sins so that we can be in a right relationship with you, so that we can hear from you, and so that you can speak to us this morning. Lord God, we praise you and we thank you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Go ahead and stand with me this morning, or with us, and let's continue worshiping this song. Thank you. 
to your presence this morning as the Lord of all, the, the Lord of the universe. God, we're humbled. We're unworthy. I think of Isaiah, who when he stood before you, he says, woe am I, and I'm ruined. Because I am a man of unclean lips among a people of unclean lips. God, we are unworthy. Yet through Christ, you have made us worthy. And so we praise you as we behold you this morning. As we come to the time of teaching in your word this morning, God. Lord, I pray that you would speak to our hearts, that we would hear from you this morning what, what you have to say. Speak to us so that we may hear. It's in Christ's precious name I pray. Amen. Earlier this week, Charity and I were, were watching a, a TV show. It's called Lone Star 911. If you've never seen that show, it's, it's one of those medical dramas, uh, but it involves the police and the fire department and the 
uh, paramedics, and also 911 operators. And, and so in this particular show, they were giving uh, the backstory on one of the firemen. And in his younger life, when he was 14 years old, uh, a friend who, who was a couple of years younger convinced him to, to take their dad's car on a joyride. And so they're, it shows them driving and going down the street and everything's okay until they get to a stoplight and another car pulls up beside them and starts revving its engine. And they decided to, to race. And so you've got a 14-year-old and a 12-year-old in a uh, fast car and they are racing. They lose control, hit a tree head on, and the passenger, the 12-year-old, dies. And the mother of the 12-year-old, this is his best friend who was driving, the, the mother of the 12-year-old never forgave. She was bitter, never forgave the, the other boy who, who grew up to be a firefighter. And, and she was bitter to the point that, that it showed later on when he was actually a firefighter, got called to her house because she fell and broke her arm or her shoulder. And she saw his name tag, realized who he was, and started screaming, get him out of my house. She would have rather not gotten help than to have help from him. And so he's talking to uh, his girlfriend, and, and she's telling him that, she's got, that he's got to do something. He's got to take the first steps to make this right. And, and so he begins to go to her house, and it's in shambles on the outside. The fence is falling apart. The, the mailbox is turned over to the side. The, the yard's a mess. The porch has got holes rotted in it. And so he begins to, he doesn't talk to her, he doesn't knock on the door, he just begins to go and work. And he fixes the fence and paints it, fixes the mailbox, cleans up the yard. And she begins to look out the window. This is a period of weeks, I believe, that this is happening. And, and she looks out the window and then will close it real quick. Never says anything to him. And then he finishes repairing the porch and painting the porch. And he's stepping back to look at it and the door opens. And he's thinking the whole time, the first conversation he has with her might be her spitting in his face. He has no idea what to expect. And the door opens and she steps out. And she hands him a glass of lemonade. And she says, would you like to come in and talk? And he said, absolutely. I would love to come in and talk. Their relationship was, was hopelessly broken until it wasn't. Uh, their, their relationship went from a place of brokenness to a place of reconciliation. And, and reconciliation means to restore a relationship. So let me ask you, ha have you ever had a relationship that was broken? Maybe similar to that. You, you've had a relationship where someone got hurt. And the, the relationship was no longer what it used to be. It was no longer a real relationship. It was broken. It was one in need of reconciliation. Maybe you're still in a relationship like that today. Uh, this morning we're going to look at, at what God has to say in his word about reconciliation through the Apostle Paul. And we're going to see that, that reconciliation brings you to God and then it sends you out to others. So let's read this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, beginning, uh, beginning in verse, where are we? Beginning in verse 17, and then we're going to go all the way down through chapter 6 and in verse 2. Paul writes this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and see, the new has come. Everything is from God who has reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And he has committed the message of reconciliation to us. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we plead on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. He made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Working together with him, we also appeal to you, don't receive the grace of God in vain. 
For he says, at an acceptable time, I listened to you. And in the day of salvation, I helped you. So now is the acceptable time. Now is the day of salvation. We, we all have a need to be reconciled with God. In Ephesians chapter 2, Paul says that, that we are all sinners and that we are all in a broken relationship with God, that, that everyone who has ever been born, except for Jesus, everyone who has ever been born has been born in sin, in a broken relationship with God. He says that, that we are by nature children under wrath. And that means that, that you and I are born as sinners and that our sin has caused us to be the enemies of God. We're, we're born separated from God. We, we come into the world in a broken relationship with God and because of our sin that causes that broken relationship, we deserve his wrath. That's what scripture says about us and about God. Now remember that we're not sinners because we sin. We sin because we are sinners. You didn't, you didn't start sinning one day and all of a sudden you become a sinner. You, you, you sin because you have been from birth by nature is what Paul says. By nature from birth we are sinners. And because of your sin, because of my sin... The relationship that we should have with God is broken, and there's only one way that that can be fixed, and that is through reconciliation to God. And writing about being reconciled to God, Paul's going to show us some benefits of reconciliation. And he's also going to show us that, that reconciliation with God is not the end, it's just the beginning. So as we walk through this passage together this morning, I want us to see what God has to say about reconciliation and you. And we'll start by, by looking at what Paul says about the truth that reconciliation brings you to God. In verse 18, Paul says that, that God has reconciled us to himself through Christ. And remember that, that reconciliation is the restoration of a broken relationship. Our relationship with God was broken, but through Christ, God has provided a way for us to be reconciled. And I want to make sure that we, we understand as we read and as we go through this passage who God is speaking to, because that's important for us to, to know who he's speaking to, to know what he's saying. Because in verse 19, it says, In Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. Paul is not saying that in Christ God has already reconciled everyone to himself. That would mean that, that everyone is saved. That would mean that the Great Commission has already been fulfilled. In fact, the Great Commission would have had no need to, to begin because God automatically saved everyone. That's not what Paul is saying. He, he's writing to Christians and he's saying those of you who are in Christ, those of you who are already reconciled, your sins have been forgiven and you have been reconciled, brought into this relationship with Christ. He has though, listen, he has not reconciled everyone, but he has made reconciliation available to everyone. And, and everyone, the scripture says that, that anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. If you repent and you believe in Christ, you will be reconciled. So he has reconciled all those who have come to him in repentance and faith. But he has not reconciled everyone. By reconciling those of us who are saved, God has brought us into a special relationship with him. What was broken has now been made whole. And Paul shares several benefits that exist for those who are reconciled. To begin with, Paul says that, that when God reconciles you, he makes you a new creation. God makes you a new creation. Those who are in Christ are a new creation. Back over in Ephesians chapter 2 again, Paul says, that, and we're not going to read it, but, but Paul says that there, there are really multiple groups, specifically two groups that he's talking about there. But, but you think of in the Old Testament, and even in Jesus' day, Jew and Gentile were, were in opposition. There were different groups. Men and women were, were different groups. Lost and saved. Masters and slaves. He's saying there's, today, 
Democrat and Republican, right? We're two different groups. White and black, we're two different groups. And, and Paul says in Ephesians 2 that, that God has taken, the, in Christ, God has taken those two different groups and he's brought them together and he's made one new group that transcends every single one of those other groups. That every other identity that you can have, that this new group transcends all of those. And that new group is Christian. In Christ, we are made new. And that new group is Christians. And, and listen, Christianity, as some people falsely claim, is not the white man's religion. Jesus died to reconcile people from every nation, from every language, from every people group. Now, the bride of Christ is a multi-ethnic, multicultural group of people who have been reconciled together to become one new people in God. It's a people from every nationality and background, and we are all new in Christ. And so what, what Paul is saying here is that when you're reconciled to God, you're not who you were. How many of y'all have, you, you obviously, I'm sure you know, the, the little name tag that you can get, and it says, hello, my name is, right? And you're supposed to write your, your name in there. A lot of times when we think about ourselves and we think, hello, my name is, we, we want to write things in there like, hello, my name is unworthy. Hello, my name is shame. Hello, my name is, my name is regret. My name is drug addict. My name is alcoholic. My name is insecure. My name is fearful. My name is unfaithful. My name is unloved. My name is worry. My name is pride. My name is selfish. My name is unforgiven. But in Christ, yeah, that may be who you were, but, but in Christ you are a new creation. That might be who you were, but that's not who you are anymore if you are in Christ. When you're reconciled to God, God no longer sees your past, no matter what it was. And so many people say, but you don't know what's in my past. You don't know what I've done. No, but God knows. And God says when he's reconciled you to himself, that your past is not your present. He, he no longer sees the dirt that was in your life. He no longer sees the filth that you felt like that you were identified by. And so when you're in Christ and you're a new creation, that, that, that sticker that says, hello, my name is, can, can say things like, hello, my name is forgiven. My, my name is redeemed. My name is loved. My name is worthy. My name is child of the king. My name is reconciled. Because in Christ, you have been reconciled. In Christ, you, you have a new name. In Christ, you have a, a new identity. Paul says that the old has passed away. See, the new has come. And in Galatians 2.20, Paul says it this way. I've been crucified with Christ, therefore I no longer live. The, that's the old, it's gone. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. That's the new that has come. And the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me, and who gave himself up for me. The old is gone. The new has come. Because you have been reconciled by God. And when you are reconciled by God. You have been made new. In addition to that. When, when God reconciles you. He makes you right with himself. Second benefit. He, he makes you right with himself. After all that's what reconciliation is. right? We said that, that that's the restoration of a relationship. God is restoring your relationship with him. But there's more to it than that. Uh, from the beginning, we, we said that you have sin that separates you from God and that causes your relationship with God to be broken. And because you have sin that separates you from God and causes that relationship to be broken, you deserve punishment. Uh, Romans 6 says that, that the punishment that we deserve for sin is death. 
So listen to me. You've sinned. You sin, which you have, right? You, you've sinned. And the punishment for death is, or the punishment for your sin is, is death, which scripture says that's clearly what it is. So here's my question. If you have sinned, if I have sinned, and the punishment for our sin is death, how can God reconcile us to himself? How can God make us right with himself and still be a just and righteous and holy God? How can God see my sin and bring me back into a relationship with him and be just and holy and righteous? And the answer is he can't. He can't bring me back into a relationship because my sin, the punishment is death. And so without death, he can't bring me, he can't bring you back into a relationship with him. So we have a problem. We deserve death. We can't be brought back into a relationship with him. But in verse 21, Paul tells us what God did to solve that problem. He says that he made the one, talking about Jesus, he made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us. Jesus, the perfect, spotless, sinless Lamb of God was made sin for you. He, he became sin because of you. Listen to this closely. Jesus was punished for your sin as if he is the one that committed your sin. Because he became sin for you. You. And that's the only way that we could be made right with God. That's the, the only way that we could be reconciled. And that's what Paul is talking about in verse 19 where he says that, that God did not count your sins against you. Make no mistake, your sins had to count against someone. Your sins have to count against someone, but, but he didn't count them against you. So how is this possible? It's because he transferred your sin onto Christ. He made the one who knew no sin to become sin for you. Jesus had no sin and now he has your sin. I want to talk about unfair. Right, right. In our lives, we, we see things that are happening. We're like, that's unfair. God, God that's not fair. Oh, this, this is not fair. Jesus getting our sin is not fair. Jesus getting punished for your sin and my sin, that, that's not fair. But listen to me. I don't want fair. I want mercy. I don't want fair. I want grace. I don't want fair. I want reconciliation. Because I know what fair means. If God treats me fairly, that means I'm dead in my sins. But with mercy and grace, God reconciles me to Christ. God took your sin and he transferred it on to Jesus, then he poured out his wrath on Jesus because of your sin. And when we repent of our sin, when you repent of your sin and trust in the finished work of Christ, when you trust that, that Jesus lived the sinless life, that he died on the cross in your place, that he rose from the dead, when you believe that, you repent and believe that you are saved, you are reconciled to God, he makes you right with himself. But that's just half of the transaction that takes place. That's just half of what God does when he reconciles you. When God reconciles you to himself, he also gives you the righteousness of Christ. Verse 21 begins, we, we've read it. It says that he made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us, to be sin for you. But that's not the end of the verse. He goes on to say that, that not only did, did he become sin for you, but, but that you got his righteousness. For those of you who are memorizing the Sermon on the Mount with us, chapter 5, well, we're deep into chapter 5 right now. But you'll remember back a few weeks in verse 20, Jesus says this. He says, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes, of, scribes and Pharisees, you will never get into heaven. These are the most righteous people we can think of that ever lived. They follow the law like nobody else could. Listen, we couldn't possibly live up to their righteousness. Because we have not followed the law anywhere near what they follow the law. So how can we possibly have a righteousness that exceeds their righteousness? 
He made the one who did not know sin to become sin for us. To, to reconcile us to himself. And then he says that he gave us so that in him, that is in Christ, we might become the righteousness of God. So listen to the whole verse. God made him, God made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us. And he did that so that in him, in Christ, we might become the righteousness of God. Martin Luther called this the great exchange. Christ got our sin. We got his righteousness. Our sin for his righteousness. That is a great exchange. That, that's what happens when you surrender your life to Christ. Your, your sin gets transferred to him and his righteousness gets transferred to you. He didn't deserve your sin and you don't deserve his righteousness. But that's what God has done to bring you into a right relationship with him. Reconciliation brings you to God. But that's not all it does. Reconciliation also sends you to others. <clears throat> Paul mentions this in, in verse 18 and then again in verse 19. And in verse 20, he gives you a title to what he's talking about, to what we're to be and what we're to do. When you're reconciled to God, verse 18 says that you are given the ministry of reconciliation. And then in verse 19, it says that God has committed to you the message of reconciliation. And in verse 20, Paul says that, that when you are reconciled, you become an ambassador for Christ. Now, uh, an ambassador... It is one who speaks and acts on behalf of another. So you think about the, an ambassador from the United States to a foreign country. As the ambassador goes in to speak to the leader of this other country, it's as if the president of the United States is standing in that room speaking. The ambassador, everything the ambassador does and everything the ambassador says is a representation of what the president does and says. And then Paul says that we are ambassadors for Christ. Christ is the one that is in charge that we are under. And so we are ambassadors to, to, for him. Uh, we have been given both the ministry and the message of reconciliation. And that means that we're to go out on behalf of Christ and take the message of reconciliation to others. That means, listen, that means that you have to be careful in how you act. It means you have to be careful in what you say, both in person and, listen, online. You have to be careful because you are an ambassador for Christ. You're representing him to the world. They see Christ. The world sees Christ through you. So we're going to marinate on that. Just think on that for just a minute. The world sees Christ through through you. So that the question is, what are they seeing when they see Christ through you? What is the world seeing when they see Jesus through you? What do they think about Jesus if they're looking at you? What do they see in Jesus? Is your speech, right? What, what are they hearing Jesus say if the world is looking at you as a representation, as an ambassador for Christ? Do you live as Christ would live? Do you go where Christ would go? Do you do what Christ would do? Do you say what Christ would say? If you are reconciled to God, listen to me. If you are reconciled to God, you are an ambassador for Christ. That, that's not up for debate. Here's the question. What kind of ambassador are you? What kind of representation are you of Christ to the world? That's between you and God. We're not going to dive into that today, but I want you to know that, that you are an ambassador. And as an ambassador, you have been given the privilege. It's not a duty. It's not a responsibility. It's not a pain that I have to do. We've, we've been given, you've been given the privilege of taking the message of reconciliation to the world. That's what God has called us to do. So as an ambassador, listen, you share what others need to hear. Take a look at the message in verse 20. He says, we, we plead on Christ's behalf. Some, some translations say we beg. 
Right? We beg you, we, we plead with you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. That's the message that others need to hear. So, so whether you're here in person, whether you're watching online, we're excited that you're with us. But, but here's the message for you today. Be reconciled to God. That, that's what I'm standing up. I, I beg you, I plead with you, be reconciled to God. And then in verse 1 of chapter 6, Paul says, we, we appeal to you. Don't receive the grace of God in vain. We, we plead with you, be reconciled to God. We appeal to you, don't receive the grace of God in vain. Now, what he's saying there, he's saying that do not hear this message in vain. God is offering you grace and forgiveness and mercy and reconciliation. And don't receive the message in vain. Don't walk away. We beg you to be reconciled to God. We appeal to you. Don't receive the message in vain. So many people in, in America, listen, we've heard the gospel so many times that, that it just doesn't affect us anymore. People hear the gospel over and over and their heart turns cold to it. And I think that's why Paul said, we plead with you, we're begging you, be reconciled to God because we've heard it so much. The message of the gospel, Jesus is God the Son, and he left the glories of heaven. He was born of a virgin, lived a sinless life. He died on the cross as a substitute for you and for me. He was buried in the tomb. He rose on the third day. He ascended to heaven. He's seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will return again one day. We participated in secret church on Friday night and it was phenomenal and one of the things that we learned is that there are 7,000 people groups in our world that have no access to the gospel 3 billion people 40% of the world's population has no access to the gospel we, we say things like Christ is going to return for his church, and I can't wait till it happens. I'm ready to go today. But what does Jesus say in Matthew 24? That until everybody hears, there's 3 billion people that have never heard. And we talk like we want God to return. We want Christ to return today. But we're not living like it. What are we doing to reach 3 billion people that have never heard? Don't hear the message in vain. Act on the message. Some people say things like this. When you talk with them about the gospel, I'm just not ready yet. I'll get there, but I'm just not there yet. I'll do it later. I have plenty of time. But look what Paul says in verse 2 of chapter 6. It says, now is the acceptable time. Now is the day of salvation. Y'all help me with this. When is the acceptable time? Now. That was pitiful. When is the acceptable time? Now. When is the day of salvation? Now. now. Now is the time. There's no better time to get saved than today. There's no better time to be reconciled to Christ than today. So surrender your, your life to Christ. Now, let today be the day of salvation. April 25th, 11, 17 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Let today be the day that you heard the good news about reconciliation of Christ and surrendered your life to him. Let today be the day that you confess your sins to God and ask him to forgive you. Let today be the day that your sinfulness is removed from you and that Christ's righteousness is applied to you. Reconciliation brings you to God and it sends you to others. Another way to say that is reconciliation changes your position. And it redirects your mission. Reconciliation changes your position and it redirects your mission. There are only two needs in this place today. There are only two needs for those of you who are watching online today. Some of you need to be reconciled to God. And the rest of you need to proclaim reconciliation to the world. When you're reconciled to God, your message gets, or your mission rather, gets redirected. 
those who are already forgiven, you're, you're already reconciled with God. Your mission is to proclaim <coughs> reconciliation to the world. So would you commit to doing that? Would you commit to proclaiming that Paul says that we've been given the ministry of reconciliation, that God has committed the message of reconciliation to us, and that we are ambassadors for Christ who must take the message of re reconciliation. Would you commit to doing that this week? Right now, I want you to think of one person. You all know one person. Friend, family, co-worker, you all know one person who is not saved. Who, if they died today, would split hell wide open. But would you commit to taking the message of reconciliation to them this week? Or would you go to that person this week and, and proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ? Uh, another way that you can do that, we have these invite cards. They're out on the desk, right as you turn out the door in the back. Take these invite cards, hand them to someone this week. Invite them to come to hear the message of reconciliation. We are ambassadors and it is our privilege to get the message of reconciliation out because our mission has changed. And, and not only that, when you're, when you're reconciled to God, your position has changed. You move from, from an enemy of God who deserves his wrath to a child of God receiving his forgiveness. And so here's, here's what I would ask you to do. If you're here in person today, if you're watching online today, and you have, you have moved from a position of, of being an enemy of God to being a child of God, from being lost to being reconciled, I want to know about that. For those of you here in person, the welcome card's on the seat in front of you. Fill that out, drop it in the offering plate. That'll come directly to me. For those of you who are watching online, click the digital connection card link, fill that out, and send that in. That'll come straight to me. But here's the deal. Now, now is the acceptable time. Now is the day of salvation. Don't wait another day. Get it taken care of today. And so with Paul, I'm up here pleading, be reconciled to God. He's, he's done everything that has to be done to bring you into a right relationship with him. Confess your sin, believe that Jesus took your sin, that he died in your place, that he rose on the third day, that he's come again. Repent and believe, and you'll be reconciled to God. Voice that from your heart. I say over and over again that there are no magic words. There's not a, a secret prayer in the Bible. If you just say these specific words, you'll get saved. But when we talk about praying for salvation, it's an expression of what's happening inside and really what's already happening. You're just expressing that to God. And so if you were to do that, it's going to sound something like this. God, I, I know that I'm a sinner. And I know as a sinner, I'm deserving of your wrath. But I'm asking you, I'm trusting you that you'll save me. I repent of my sins. I confess. I believe that what Jesus Christ did on the cross, that he did it for me, that he did it in, in my place. And so I repent of my sin and I trust in Christ to save me. God, save me. If you would express that from your heart. Again, no magic words not a certain way that you say it. It's the posture of your heart because of the work that God has done in your heart. Just express that to God, repentance and belief, and you will be saved. If you have questions about what it means to be saved, that's one of my favorite things to do is to talk to people about what it means to be saved. I love the opportunity to do that. So if you have questions about what it means to be saved, again, fill out a card. Message in online. Let me know. I want to come and talk with you about that. I plead with you on behalf of Christ. Be reconciled to God. And I appeal to you. Don't take the message of God's grace in vain today. Remember that reconciliation changes your position and it redirects your mission. So be reconciled to God today and then bring the message of reconciliation to others.
I'm going to pray for us, and then we're going to sing a song together. Jesus paid it all. And as we sing that song together, I want you to, to hear the words, to, to think about the words, and I want you to spend time in prayer with God. And again, if you've never repented and trusted in Christ, now is the acceptable time. Today is the day. Let's pray together. You are, God, the great and mighty God, awesome in wonder and in power. You are the God who saves. Uh, we read in Hebrews that, that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He saved yesterday, he saves today, and he will save forever. And so, God, I, as your ambassador, am, am pleading for everyone in the sound of my voice, for those who are watching online, whether it's live today or maybe it's some day further in the week, God, I pray that, that they'll be reconciled to God. Lord, we thank you that you've gifted us, given us the privilege of the ministry of reconciliation, and I pray that we would be good ambassadors for Christ. Lord, you are the one who reconciles. And I pray that you would do that in lives today. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together and sing this song. Jesus paid it all. sacrificial in your giving. Uh, you can give here in person. You can give online. For those of you who are watching online, you'll see across the bottom of the screen, there's a number that you can text that'll send you a link. Uh, there's also our website. You go to the website in the lower right-hand side, you'll, say, uh, you'll see where it says click here to give. Uh, we invite you to participate in what the Lord is doing through our church in our community. And give, again, faithfully, cheerfully, and sacrificially. This is a gift to the Lord. Let's pray. God, you take what seems to be nothing and make it great. And you created the world out of nothing. Lord, Jesus took a couple of pieces of bread and a couple of fish and fed thousands. So we know that you can take 
what is little and make much of it. God, I pray that that's what you would do with, with our offering, that we would be faithful in our giving, sacrificial in our giving, knowing that, that it's yours anyway, God. We're, we're just giving back a portion of what you've blessed us with. But then, God, we'll, we pray that you would take what we are giving and that you would make it do great and mighty things for your kingdom so that your name can be known in our community, so that your name can be made great throughout the world. That is our prayer this morning, God, as we worship you through our giving. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen. Let's sing this song together. Turn your eyes on Jesus. Gather with God's people today. Amen? Amen. 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 
Uh, remember, Wednesday night Bible study through Answers in Genesis is at 7 o'clock. Uh, meal is at 6 o'clock. If you have questions about that and need more information, see uh, Al Bayless and he can fill you in on that. Uh, next Sunday morning, uh, communion. We'll have communion at the end of the service next Sunday morning. Uh, Bible study, 915, worship at 1030. So I pray that you'll be prepared and be here for that. You'll see in the bulletin our scripture reading uh, for this week on our reading pro plan. We're in 2 Corinthians and we'll be reading uh, chapters 3 through 7 this week. And so I hope that you're still participating in that, reading scripture every day, journaling and spending time in prayer. Uh, Al Bayless, I'm going to ask you if you would to dismiss us in prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come before you today. You're the Almighty God, the everlasting King, and the Creator of the universe. And we're just humbled that we can come before you today and hear your word. Lord, we hear, we hear you what you say today, and we want to heed the, the uh, reconciliation. Lord, help us to come together with you once again and to restore that relationship, be together with you for all eternity. Bless our week, words of Jesus. Amen.